Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Tana Starbuck Cisco. Uh, she is a professor of, of sociology and the chair of the Department of Sociology and Social Work at St. Anselm College. Dr. Cisco's research include, interests include gender and politics, media studies of social problems, postpartum depression, and rhetoric of ambivalence and its impact on congressional support and public policy concerning homeless women. I'll turn it over to Dr. Cisco to introduce our other distinguished panelists and begin the discussion. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, first of all, thank you for everybody uh, for joining us today. Um, I wanna first also welcome my colleagues, our faculty who have generously uh, given their time to talk to you about teaching in a pandemic. So let's go ahead and allow them to introduce themselves first. Uh, Gary, you are up. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Bouchard, a very uh, longtime member of the English department and uh, currently have the honor of serving as the founding director of the Gregory J. Graponi Humanities Institute so that my uh, responsibilities and duties uh, as COVID came upon us are both curricular and co-curricular, um, keeping uh, quite a few things alive, teaching in the core as well as uh, English majors, obviously. Thanks, Gary. All right, next up, Kathleen Cahill of Nursing. Hi, I'm Katie Davidson Cahill, a class of 1980. And I've been teaching here on the Hilltop in the nursing department for the last 16 years. Um, I teach pediatric nursing. Wonderful, thanks Katie. All right, Jen, next up from politics. Hi, I'm Jen Lucas. Uh, I'm uh, the chair and uh, professor in the Department of Politics. And uh, my area of focus is American politics uh, and especially gender in politics. And Professor Cisco and I have co-authored several things together. And finally, uh, Bill Ryerson of biology. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Ryerson from the biology department. Um, my specialties are anatomy and physiology, both human and animal. Um, and I do research in animal behavior and movements. All right, thank you. Okay, so this first question is for you, Gary. I recall hearing you say that in your years as a college professor, two events have radically reshaped how you have worked. Those events were the introduction of email and now the COVID-19 pandemic. What's it like teaching in a pandemic, Gary? Uh, in what ways have you had to adjust to student learning? Um, yeah, thank you for that. So um, I think, uh, I made that observation in a, a Come Friday forum that uh, Tana gave the first one this year on how uh, COVID-19 was changing our lives and our society. Um, and I have to uh, admit at the outset that, that that first change that I was referencing means that I came to teach at St. Anselm um, at a time when there was only a phone on my desk. There, there was no such thing as a, uh, a college computer and uh, nor a thing called the internet, so yeah. I'm old. Um, I think within a few years after that, that meant, of course, um, back in that day, when you went home at night, you went home at night and you might have graded or studied or written or done your thing, but you weren't interacting with students after hours. That, that just wasn't a thing. And email uh, quickly changed that um, with, so that within a few years um, with, with the internet um, and, and email and then um, uh, the learning platforms, we were engaging with our students. And once, once that turned into smartphones, uh, you never really went home again. <laughs> and um, because uh, students, we, we, I think we all have gotten a rhythm with college students where they contacted us when they're doing their work starting at 10 o'clock at night. And we close that loop when we start our work at 5.30 or six in the morning. And that is a, that is a rhythm that has really expanded um, our relationship and, and the availability of teacher to student. Um, then last spring, as what I would I anticipate is a second radical change is that there will never be another snow day. Um, there'll be never another reason for not having a meeting or having a class. And um, we've, uh, those of us who, who teach have, have now been inside of our students' dorm rooms, their kitchens, uh, their bedrooms, uh, and there's in, they've been in our homes through this strange video medium. Um, so I've now done um, uh, at least once or twice uh, a long advising session as well as worked with a student paper while they were uh, in the passenger seat of their car driving with their family. 
Uh, I just think those, uh, those two events have removed the boundaries for better or for worse um, in, in how we uh, structure our time or do not structure our time because as it turns out, we're always available whether we're wearing dress pants or sweatpants. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Katie, uh, we know that the pandemic has hit especially close uh, to home uh, with many of our frontline workers who are St. Anselm College nursing grads. Um, we know that hospital restrictions have also impacted current nursing major training and how you in essence uh, teach. Um, as a nursing faculty member, what are some innovative techniques that you've created to adjust specifically to the clinical hospital restrictions? And how do you think it's gone? Okay, so last semester, obviously with no clinical because of the pandemic and we closed the school, um, we really had to look for some online simulation kind of activities for our students because they were not able to have any of that hands-on. So the, we found a number of different types of virtual simulations that were available online. And then we would have the students watch the simulations and then we would Zoom with them to talk about, okay, so where was this patient? What do we need to do? Um, and I think because our students are so engaged in the lectures and everything, we found that recorded lectures were not, they were not really fans of, they really liked the Zoom lectures so that we could interact with them. Um, now for this semester, since we are still in some of the hospitals doing clinical, which is fabulous. Um, but unfortunately, we're not in the schools. So especially for pediatric well uh, visits, we can't do those anymore. So we've used, um, we found an avatar um, called Shadow Health that um, we go through five different pediatric clients. And the students are able to literally, it's kind of like a Zoom where they can um, ask questions of the patient. Um, and that has really been very successful this semester. Oh, good. Uh, thanks for telling us about that. An avatar, nursing avatar. That's neat. All right, Jen. Uh, at the college, we as educators uh, extensively incorporate experiential learning in our curriculum and our coursework. Uh, as we know that it provides an experience that allows our students to engage with community members. Jen, I know you teach courses with service learning components. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about service learning in a pandemic? Uh, what innovative techniques have you done to give students hands-on experience this semester? Thanks, Tana, and uh, thanks again to everyone for having us here. I think this is really a wonderful discussion. Uh, it's been, so over the summer, faculty had a number of discussions about important issues that had arisen in the spring and things that we were thinking about and how could we sort of have an Anselmian experience in our classrooms, even if we weren't actually in the classroom or if we were, we were wearing masks and socially distanced. And so one of the biggest challenges that we identified was uh, the issue of sort of creating community in the classroom and sort of a sense of bonding across the students. And so uh, when uh, the Mealy Center approached me about doing service learning again, I thought that that might've been a good way for students to help to build community. And uh, so not only reaching out to the community, but also building community within the classroom. And uh, so uh, the Melia Center did a wonderful job of really working with our community partners uh, to try to identify sites where we could try to have some um, remote uh, interactions. And so uh, my students, for example, in my American government class this semester are working with uh, the Moore Center, which uh, is a center for uh, people with intellectual disabilities. They have all kinds of services. And so my students are actually offering a class in American government and uh, they're teaching uh, uh, people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, you know, they're having the same kinds of conversations that we're having in our course. And uh, frankly, I find the best way to learn is to teach. And so our, my students are getting a chance to do that. Uh, on the flip side, you know, the same challenges that nursing is facing, I think students are facing across the college, which is how do they get the kind of experience that they would have gotten with an internship uh, or other, you know, uh, we often have students on campaigns and that kind of stuff. Um, how are they gonna get that experience, that networking experience, make those contacts so that when they go into the workforce. Uh, so that's one of the things I worry most about students, uh, especially seniors who are graduating or especially the seniors uh, that graduated in the spring and 
and some of those opportunities cut short. Is there anything that your department's doing or thinking about to make sure to sort of build a foundation for those students or other areas? Um, or how are you uh, prepping them to network knowing that they don't have the same pathways available to them right now? So uh, we're trying to uh, encourage them to still look for remote options. Uh, I will say that uh, some of the uh, presidential campaigns, for example, are still doing door knocking uh, on one side at least. Uh, and so there are opportunities that way. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there's, you know, the trade off uh, in terms of, you know, trying to maintain that bubble on campus and trying to keep people on campus as much as possible. Uh, so right now we're, you know, working with the career development office and uh, they have a number of opportunities for students and we're encouraging them to think about remote options as well. Uh, and many of them are pretty resourceful. So I, I have a feeling they'll find some, some way around this. All right. Thanks. Okay, Bill. Uh, we know that the lack of adequate, adequate classroom space and group hands-on learning has created a particular challenge for faculty in the STEM fields. What are some ways that you've pivoted using online technology and online education this semester? Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. Um, so there's, yeah, this is certainly an issue that like uh, Gary has mentioned and Katie has mentioned, this idea of innovation and how we, how we bridge a lot of these different pieces. Um, and I think in some cases with some of the STEM courses, we have this combined issue of sometimes very large classes. Um, we are trying to provide adequate interaction with groups of, of 100 or so students, and also those in-person lab scenarios that the students often you know, really take home. And with the pivot to online learning, um, a lot of that was kind of taken away from us. So I tried a couple of things. Um, one of the things that, that um, I've had a bit of success with is I actually uh, built a very rudimentary green screen in the, in the basement of my home. Um, and using, you know, literally, you know, my, my iPad and um, a lot of Googling of errors, I was able to kind of create asynchronous videos that my students can watch. And it was basically set up so that I was standing in front of my normal PowerPoint slides. And so while I couldn't necessarily bring everyone to the lecture, I could bring my lectures to everyone. Um, and some of these have been, have been shared across groups and I've certainly heard from some of my colleagues that, that some of them have been seen. And so that for one, one way was for me to try to restore a sense of normalcy was saying, okay, we can still do a lot of the things that we used to do. We just have to be creative about how we do it. Um, the lab is obviously a much different animal because one of the, especially in the anatomy and physiology courses, you know, things like dissection are really a key central component to how we run those classes. And a virtual dissection is very hard to do. And, and a lot of us would argue it's not really the same. And so we kind of embraced um, technologies where when we can get the students into the classroom, we're certainly focusing on that. Um, and for example, I'm holding my laptop for a reason. Um, we have a whole bunch of these um, three-dimensional anatomy apps now where I can zoom in on particular aspects of the anatomy. I can make the students rotate them in 3D space. We can still highlight the same structures. And while it's certainly not the same as the, the in-person um, lab environment, we can use a lot of these tools now to say, augment some of that, where I can say, we're gonna focus on the things we can dissect when we do have a time. Um, but then when we are looking at other aspects online, there are lots of tools that we could use. And a lot of it's just exposing the students and integrating those tools into the things that we've already done. Bill, I was told that you were willing to share one of your lectures. Is that is that fair that we could put that in the chat at some point? I, I feel like Professor Cisco, as my senior colleague, you have guilted me into this, but yes, absolutely. Um, there, I do believe I sent you a couple if you wanna throw in, in the chat. Yep, I will do. Okay, I, I can do that again. Uh, but I wanna stick, I wanna come back to you though. I have an, a second follow-up question for you. And then I'll open this up to everybody else in the group. Um, how did your experience this spring uh, with remo remote learning really inform your pedagogy this fall? So when we, when we switched in the spring, um, I, I, I don't wanna say it was, we were making the best of a bad situation, but we were. We had we had a little bit of time to pivot, and I think a lot of us leaned on what we already knew how to do. Um, you know, me being uh, uh, in my other classes, I tend to write a lot on the whiteboard and have this back and forth. And so, 
that was basically what I did was I recorded myself writing on my iPad's little whiteboard and I audio recorded of that and sent that to the students. Um, and I think what, what I learned very quickly is I hated that because I had no way of really interacting with the students at all. Um, and so what I wanted to do was say, okay, if I, if I am gonna lose that interaction and even sort of editing my own videos, I was getting bored and uninterested. How can I make this more engaging for the students? And then at least we have the summer to, to prep some of that to sort of say, okay, I'm not a fan of just recording myself talking over the PowerPoint slides. How can I make this more engaging in a way that will help the students stay interested and, and engaged throughout the whole throughout the whole semester as opposed to a, a four or five week kind of crash course. All right. Uh, anybody else? Gary, let's circle back to you. Uh, how'd your experience this spring uh, with remote learning inform your pedagogy this fall? What I was doing in the spring was so very different than what uh, I'm doing in the fall. So they're pretty different experiences. Uh, when COVID came upon us last March, um, I was teaching a large, uh, mostly lecture class of Renaissance literature, 27 students. Um, and I had incorporated into my pedagogy over the last couple of years, a, a, always a PowerPoint visual component to each lecture. So I kept doing what I was doing, only doing it the way we're doing this webinar. Um, and the freshman English class that I was writing was uh, that I was teaching. That's interesting to teach writing in this mode. Um, actually, worked extremely well um, because, of course, you can put student papers right up uh, and share your screen and do the editing with them, especially uh, one on one, one on three. Um, that that worked well. Both classes, in fact, worked well. Uh, for whatever reasons, the upperclassmen literature class, um, the majority of them preferred to keep themselves uh, off video. And um, I think so the, the humanities uh, based courses, as anybody uh, would tell you, depend so much on classroom community. Uh, the content that we're doing is really important, but as important is um, that we're there doing the basics of humanities, which is paying attention to a, an important text and paying attention to one another. That's the essence of what humanistic education is. Um, so the fall, um, as it turns out, I had two sections of Conversatio, which is our freshman humanities uh, program. And um, while I knew I would have to count on Zoom in, in some respects, um, I pivoted back to the fifth century before the common era uh, and, and doing essentially what Socrates and the others did. Um, I've moved outdoors. Uh, bought camp chairs for my students and we have met on, on the quad. Uh, we've only had to Zoom twice. Uh, the weather has been amazing. Uh, some days hot, some days gray. Um, I think we've reached 46 degrees this week and the students said that's as low as they're willing to go. Um, so um, that's a very different pedagogy and a very ancient pedagogy, uh, more or less six feet apart in mass. Um, gathered in a circle, uh, a bonding experience with freshmen like I've never had. I, I suspect, and, and, and these are experiences that they've never had. I think in, in, there will come a day when we will all look back um, and, and marvel that we did this, but uh, they've been brave. And um, as I say, very, very old fashioned pedagogy, um, but somehow through masks, uh, we've managed to make it work. Thanks, Katie, how about you? Uh, well, last semester we were just doing Zoom, um, but now this semester in the I'm actually teaching in the classroom. I have a large lecture hall that seats 100 that I have 23 students in this semester. Um, and we still do the Zoom, like tonight we're doing an exam review um, over Zoom because it's so difficult in the classroom to um, get their feedback because it's very hard to hear because I've got a mask on, they've got a mask on, we were in this large lecture hall. So we still like to use the Zoom so that I can actually see them. Um, and it's much more interactive, um, but it's been challenging, but at least we're back in clinical. 
so that we do get that hands-on, which, um, you know, we're trying to play catch up actually from last semester because those students didn't get, you know, possibly they didn't do their maternity rotation. Mm -hmm. So they've never really taken a, you know, a blood pressure or a heart rate or respiratory rate on a baby. So now in pediatrics, at least they get to do that, so. All right, Jen, how about you? Yeah, I agree with what everyone said. I, I would just say one of the things I thought was interesting uh, in the spring is, uh, so I also do a lot of uh, interaction in my classes. And uh, one thing I learned from uh, uh, the spring was that using Canvas, uh, it was actually when you sort of uh, require that everyone responds online, that you actually get those students that don't always feel comfortable in the classroom jumping in. Uh, and so you get really thoughtful answers, uh, you know, in some of these online discussion boards. And so I think that sometimes um, trying new ways to sort of incorporate new ideas also sometimes hits on ways that some students learn that they excel at that you don't always do in your regular classes. Uh, and I would say just that for this semester, uh, I do think that uh, some other people have mentioned, uh, you know, Zoom can actually be uh, beneficial uh, for especially working one on one, um, because you can pretty easily share your screen. I've been sharing, students have been working on thesis projects and showing me their data set. And so, actually, in a way that we couldn't really even do as easily uh, in, you know, just face to face. So, uh, in some ways, it's actually been good. And, and I think um, the fact that I think we were careful about our class sizes uh, for this fall. It's also made for smaller classes. And so I have, you know, 15 students rather than 25 in some of my intro classes. Mm -hmm. And so that's also makes a sense of community and, and the students get to know each other a little bit better. Well, Jen, you sort, you've led me into sort of the next question. What has been a positive surprise or innovation that you've had from teaching in a pandemic? Um, but also inversely, is there anything that you tried and said, nope, never doing this again. <laughs> well, uh, so that I would say that's to me, that was the surprise it was sort of the, um, uh, I think, you know, remembering that, you know, some students like to participate, but they don't like to speak in class, right. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, uh, in terms of the nope, I, I, I think several of my colleagues would agree with me that I have learned how to give a micro lecture and that a micro lecture has to be actually micro, <laughs> which for a normal faculty member is really tough. Uh, so, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, getting it down to the essentials and really, um, you know, be having something that's uh, enough that a student is not going to tune out uh, and finding there are lots of technological tools that you can use that students can, you know, uh, give a comment or something like that. And so they can still sort of interact with the material and you can sort of check in with them. So I found those to be quite helpful. Uh, but yeah, trying to limit yourself from getting down from, you know, a, a 30 minute lecture down to five or seven minute lecture is really quite difficult. <laughs> All right, Bill, how about you? Uh, what's been a, su a positive surprise and in innovation this semester? And what's been a nope, never doing that again? Um, the, the positive surprise slash innovation was um, a lot of the different ways that we have the ability to engage the students in the material. And in the past, specifically anatomy courses, it, you know, the only thing you could often recommend was like, you just need to spend more time with the material, whether it be out of lab or try this or for you. And then the idea of being like, okay, that didn't work. All right, let's try this instead. You know, trying to find different ways so that every student can still get that personalized learning you know, flashcards don't work for everybody. So I've had students write like example exams that I've had been able to look at. Um, uh, like Jen mentioned, some of the sh uh, screen sharing so that if a student's working through one of the 3D apps, they can just screen share that with me and then we're both interacting with it at the, at the same time. Um, the, the nope, never doing that again. Oh, there's so, so many. Um, definitely the micro lecture. The idea of you know trying to take these huge lectures and and, and bring them down um, because you know you can you can feel them them losing it after you know after ten minutes um, usually and then the other thing that I that I've tried and I think I'm I'm personally guilty of it is I started to worry about students falling behind because we weren't getting that in-person time. And so I 
started assigning more low cost like quizzes and assignments. And I, I think if I was doing that and all of their other faculty were doing that, I don't know when the students are gonna have all that time. And so there was definitely a lot of like, maybe I am you know, trying too hard to assign too many things. And maybe I need to back off on that a little bit and give them a little bit, you know, some more breathers in between sections of the material. Katie, how about you? I think that um, one of the positives is that we found so much material that we could substitute for a potential clinical. But then on the other hand, I think that, oh no, is how much are we going to give them? And I think initially we somehow even overwhelmed them with like too many patients and too many things. So I think it was that balance that, you know, we've kind of found out this semester that, okay, they don't need to have, you know, uh, six different patients in one week kind of thing. Amy, uh, all right, let's go on to Gary. What about you? Positive surprises from teaching in a uh, pandemic or anything that you tried and nope, you're never doing that again. The, the positive surprise for, uh, for me, and it shouldn't really be that much of a surprise is, is the goodwill of the students, um, all freshmen. Um, it, Really, when you think about it, isn't that surprising when you think of what their senior year in high school ended up being, uh, how flexible they have been. Uh, what student doesn't like the novelty of having class outdoors, but to say, we're gonna have class outdoors all the time and to be trying to discuss uh, Augustine's nature of free will with uh, a bead of sweat coming off of their mask uh, in 85 degree sun or uh, to be, trying to get into a very difficult text like Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy with a thunderstorm hovering over and, and the, the wind blowing. Um, they've been really resilient. I'm, I'm really, really impressed at just how brave and resilient the students have been. Um, on, on the negative side, I think, and everybody can echo this, it was, it's, it's very important to build classroom community, which is why I, I didn't want to do all remote. Uh, I wanted to be physically present and also safe. Um, so the outside thing makes sense. But with the mask, in any context, um, I take a lot of pride in learning my students' names within the first class or second class. And it's uh, if all you have are eyes and foreheads, I've found learning the students' names took me up to two weeks. Um, also, this will surprise people that um, by nature, I incorporate a lot of humor and irony into my teaching. And um, I often, especially with freshmen, don't know whether they're getting the jokes or not. With a mask, I'll never know. It's, it's just a very, it's almost impossible to, to understand, to know whether your students are getting it, or whether it's a, it's a piece of serious information or a wry comment. Um, again, you're relying on eyes and eyebrows, and um, that just doesn't tell you as much. You, you, I'm surprised at how conditioned I've become over the decades to um, reading faces in order to know what to try to try next. And you just don't have that. <laughs> but in Zoom, you do. It's just delayed by a quarter second. All right. So I have some questions that have come in from the chat. I still have a whole list of questions to ask everybody, but I want to get to some of these chat questions. Um, specifically for my colleagues who are teaching some, some type of course that has a remote class attendance. One question is, what is students' responsibility as far as a remote class attendance? Do they have to be visually present? Anybody want to answer? Uh, I'll answer it. So I am teaching remotely and uh, I, um, it was definitely the case that over the course of the semester, students would be more likely to give me the dark screen. Uh, and so I've found though that just asking them to, um, uh, to put their cameras on uh, is, is they're usually more than happy to do so. I do find that if you start with a uh, group discussion where they have to go into a breakout room, they turn it on so that they can be part of a small group discussion and then they keep it on. Uh, so that's been my uh, trick. And I just wanted to say in terms of Gary's uh, earlier point, it made me think of the fact that I think one of the bigger challenges for students this semester 
is uh, they're not in the classroom, right? That they're in their, sometimes in their bedroom, their roommate is taking a nap or they're, you know, they're coming in and out. And so um, I think managing all of that in a space that is not conducive to learning sometimes, I, I'm sure is uh, contributing to their uh, overall sense of stress and not being able to focus uh, as they would if they were sitting in the classroom with other people who were doing the same thing. Uh, Bill or Katie? I think that um, we re have required the students last semester when we were doing our Zoom that they would have to be, their video would be on. Um, I think this semester, like, you know, it's difficult. Um, I mean, they're in the classroom, but I, you know, agree exactly with Gary. It's tough to know them. And I think that, you know, I am one of those people that really like to know our students and it's difficult with the masks on. You know, my smaller groups in clinical, it's much easier to identify, um, but it certainly, it can be challenging. Bill? Yeah, I would, I would agree with, with all of that. It's certainly, um, it's certainly tough. My, my lectures are all asynchronous so that the students can view them on their own time. I, I don't want to force them up here. We've done a couple of review sessions and I've, I've also seen the, the sea of darkness that Jen mentioned, um, which is really tough on the instructor. And because as Gary mentioned, there's a lot of that sort of subconscious feedback you need um, when, you're, when you're teaching. And I was, I was actually ten, telling some of the panelists before we got started, um, I haven't seen if the students don't attend the review sessions, I have actually not seen a lot of my students in person this semester. And uh, earlier this afternoon, I walked past the lab and the lab instructor came out and she said, can you stop in for a moment? Because the students were sort of joking, like they didn't think you were real for a little while. You were just the guy on the videos because I, you know, they weren't in my lab particularly. And so, and if they didn't go to the review sessions, they haven't seen me. And like, it was funny in the moment that like five, about five minutes later, I was like, oh, that's really sad. Like there's, there's an entire population of students that I have in theory been engaging throughout this whole semester and I haven't actually seen them in person yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so like certainly trying to, to balance some of the, those things is, is really tough on, on both us and especially for, for them. We have another question that comes in from another educator, a uh, high school English teacher wants to know, what digital tools did you use to simulate the normal learning experience? Did you use Jamboards or Padlets or Hype Docs, Yo Teach, oh my gosh, Nearpod, something else. Some of these I've never heard of, so you're way ahead of us, uh, Teresa Blackman. She also says, hi, Gary. Hi, Teresa. Whatever Yo Teach is, I'm in. <laughs> Anyone like to answer? I didn't use any of those things. Just Zoom and all the online avatars. I did use, um, I used Jamboard for one of my courses in the spring for a group project. Um, the students were, it was for my exercise physiology class, the students have to build a exercise program for a client or team or something like that. And they have to work with each other to kind of basically argue, argue it out in terms of recovery and exercise as well as other stuff. And using Jamboard, um, awkward at first, because again, we're used to having these sort of verbal discussions, um, but having them jot their ideas down, kind of connect the arrows, we can wipe things out. Um, we did use some of that for that one as well. Um, we also used um, Jamboard a little bit in my comparative anatomy class to sort of annotate figures and whatnot on the fly. So a student could annotate a figure and say, is this what I'm looking for? And I could say, no, I'm not quite, it's, you know, it's actually like this, but here's an example where that would work. Um, I've done some of those things. All right, I have a specific question for Jen. Election years always present some type of stress and excitement. As a politics professor, what's it like teaching during an election year and a pandemic? Uh, well, thankfully, uh, I am, um, <clears throat> uh, well, yeah. So uh, I, I am not actually teaching an elections class. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with that. I know, I, I am actually quite grateful for that. Uh, I 
I probably like many of you are a little bit burned out from the election uh, already and it hasn't even happened yet. Um, although some of you may have already voted, so maybe it's over for you. Uh, but um, yeah, so it's, uh, I think uh, in some ways is, especially for our politics students and those that are interested in it, uh, I think it, in some ways it adds uh, a little bit of additional stress uh, in some ways, it offers some opportunities. So um, the ambassador program, for example, has done some uh, interactive kinds of things where people are posting videos and to try to encourage people to register to vote and to um, express their, uh, you know, citizenship and that kind of thing. Uh, so in some ways, it's it, it's been, I think, maybe a, a tool to help uh, bring the community together and, and find innovative ways to do that. But uh, I think at this point, uh, I think we're all a little bit burned out uh, from both the semester and the election. Uh, so um, I think in that way, it can cause a little bit of uh, additional stress. And like I said, I think it's also, um, and for some students, uh, you know, they come here and they come to New Hampshire because they want to be in a, the home for politics and they want to experience the primary. Uh, so luckily, the, the silver lining is we our students got to experience the primary in the spring um, pre pandemic, we had our debates here and uh, all of that, but the students that would normally sort of be out, you know, knocking on a lot of doors, uh, there aren't quite as many of those uh, this semester. All right, uh, Gary, every Friday you host the Humanities Institute's Come Friday seminar, and those are now webinars too. What's it like engaging and teaching former students virtually? Um, it's wonderful. Um, I think technologically it's clumsy, uh, the, hy the hybrid model, um, having a, a, uh, a group of people in the room, socially distanced, and uh, up to 20 or 30 people um, online on Zoom, um, we, we still have some more work to do technologically to make that more optimal. We're getting a little bit better at it. Um, but yeah, how, uh, how exciting for people from around the country uh, or around the world if they choose to be able to join in to a, a discussion like that um, and, and have both at the same time. Um, that part has been, um, that's been exciting. I suspect the, um, the only hesitation I have there is it's now permanent. Uh, long after the pandemic, I suspect uh, having this capacity to reach an audience well beyond the room on campus um, for uh, some for any number of things is is going to be with us uh, that we're going to continue to use that technology and have to improve on that technology and never be cloistered again to just a group of people in a room. Um, in uh, in in the spring, I did a um, uh, under the umbrella of the institute. I did a version of my online Robert Frost course. Uh, which is uh, about 25 micro lectures. And uh, it was all for alums. And the alumni office, I just want to say, has been amazing during the pandemic at extending the reach of the campus with things like this. Um, but yeah, we had, I had students, uh, alumni from the 60s and the 70s out in California, people in the Midwest, people locally. Um, and that, that was exciting, as was being able to take Shakespeare's birthday um, out into the world in a way that it has never been. I don't know, it, they say like 10,000 views on YouTube or whatever it was, I have no idea. Um, but that's extraordinary that um, people were reading sonnets from their living rooms and from their, uh, from their offices all around the country. And so the idea that we're, gonna, we're just, when the pandem pandemic is over, we're gonna look back on that and say that was interesting. No, it's going to be that way now. We have to find a way to continue these things in that way um, going forth. That's gonna be a, a wonderful part of the new normal and a challenging part of the new normal. Katie, what are some unique ne uh, needs that you've seen as a nursing educator that you've had to face teaching nursing majors during a health pandemic? Well, most one of the things that has really come out is that a lot of our students do work, um, you know, for hospitals. And certainly last semester when we had, um, when we initially shut down, a lot of the big Boston hospitals wanted our students to come and help them with the COVID initiative, you know, all the issues with um, that 
in the spring. So their experience that they got then, um, and certainly lots of them still work now, you know, through the summer and into the fall. And it's been a really great um, resource for them. Good. All right, so Bill, uh, we know if anything with this pandemic, it's really put a focus on the importance of science and science education to inform policy decisions. What new teaching techniques or curriculum have you included this semester to emphasize this to students? Yeah, there's been a, a lot of that. Um, and I, and I, I'm sure, you know, Katie has as well with a, with a lot of this. Um, one of the big things that, that I've done with, especially with my human anatomy and physiology courses is, you know, said, okay, we, we talk about the structures and we talk about their function. Part of your online assignment is let's grab, you know, and actually my students are doing it. Hopefully they're doing it right now. Um, we're doing respiration. And so the assignment is, okay, you're gonna create a little PowerPoint slideshow um, submitted through VoiceThread, one of these other softwares. You're gonna tell me about three different respiratory illnesses. And I, I, of course, being the sort of person I am, I drew out the obvious one. I said, let's talk about pneumonia, you know, let's talk about cystic fibrosis, and uh, let's see, okay, fine, let's do COVID. And then have the students work through that and say, let's apply those things we talked about. The other thing that we've been doing is um, in some of the smaller group sessions is talking about basically interpreting the news and saying, okay, you've got, you know, now that you have some information and you see uh, a, a claim by, by someone or a news headline that says something, like how do we take what we know or what we've learned and filter that through, a, through our lens? And, um, mixed success on that because it's, you know, there are certainly people who won't listen to reason no matter what the science says. But the idea of being able to filter a lot of that information as the students build through their, through their education. So we can talk about, you know, we've certainly had discussions in these little groups about the effectiveness of masks and some of the big claims about masks, about, you know, certain you know, trapping carbon dioxide being one. And then we've been able to have a discussion. Okay, well, let's compare the size of a respiratory droplet, a virus, a bacteria, your food, and then carbon dioxide and say, like, all right, based on this information, what do you think is likely to happen? Um, and so it's it's not necessarily that I'm in forcing this curriculum upon them. I'm saying, well, we've got this information, this is certainly topical. Let's bring this forward. Let's let's tie what we're doing, the basic stuff that we're doing, um, which in the past I would just said, you know, if you're going to be nursing students, here you know, you're going to go into health assessment and maternity and let's, let's bring that part in. Now let's say, let's do it in a real topical situation and filter some of those headlines out. You know, it's easy to get some outlandish headlines that we can sort of spend 20, 25 minutes digging through. And I think it's really helped the students apply what they're getting in my classroom to some of the stuff that they're seeing out there. Good. Gary, you sort of answered a bit of this question uh, that came in a few minutes ago in the chat, um, and I'll paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, someday this pandemic is going to end. Uh, how do you think this will affect your teaching going forward or teaching in general? Yeah, so uh, as I said, there a, a lot of the things that we do at St. Anselm um, are going to be done um, through this medium, in addition to what we're doing on the ground, I think that is with us. Uh, pedagogically, I would anticipate working with students through this medium of Zoom on their papers for the rest of my career, uh, as well as in my office. But as, uh, as Katie pointed out, it, um, and, and Jennifer pointed out, being able to put a, uh, a student essay up on the screen and simultaneously uh, work through that draft together. You can do that in the office. This is in some ways even more efficient. Um, I don't anticipate ever going back to sending uh, an attachment in an email back and forth with a student when they're working on their senior thesis or a draft paper. I think this technology will replace that uh, going forward. At least it, it's far more efficient um, and, uh, and intimate than um, sending, sending drafts back and forth. Um, so I anticipate 
kind of group projects as well as one-on-one -on -one with professors um, that this medium is, is with us now uh, for the foreseeable future. All right, Jen, how about you? Yeah, I, uh, so um, I think I um, personally, uh, my own teaching has really benefited a lot in some ways because uh, it's forced me to kind of um, try out some new things, things that I think I thought I would do in a few years and kept getting put off. And so, um, you know, in the spring and this fall, I've, you know, recorded all kinds of micro lectures and investigated new tools and uh, come up with new, you know, kind of discussion board topics that students can look at online or group projects. And so I think in some ways it's actually uh, helped me to think about uh, my courses in a different way and uh, to help me kind of get some of the material that we were covering in class online so that students can come to class more prepared and then um, have better discussions in class. Uh, so I think in the long term that will help, uh, you know, professors, I think, think about new tools. And I think that will help students as well. Um, so far, my experience has been that the, the, the greater variety of options that you have, everyone sort of alluded to this, that, you know, students can um, excel in the places, you know, where they, um, you know, that meets their sort of uh, learning needs. And so I think that in some ways this uh, will have kind of a silver lining for our teaching because we'll be able to kind of pick and choose what works best uh, and have a whole new set of tools at our disposal. All right, thanks. Katie? I think that, um, you know, we've learned that there's so many um, available resources on YouTube, which actually will, you know, patients will talk about their experiences. Um, you know, and that certainly when you've, you're limited clinically um, to talk to a patient that, you know, talks about their experience as a child with cystic fibrosis or a child with type one diabetes. There's so much information out there. Of course, you know, it's my job to kind of sort through and make sure it's the right information, but at least they have a flavor of what it's like for uh, a patient with these kinds of illnesses that maybe we won't see in, in the clinical area. So I think it's really enhanced the teaching. And I, you know, at this point, you know, I'm good at many lectures. Um, I realized that, you know, a two hour lecture that I was doing, you just can't do that on Zoom. It's just not possible. All right, thanks. So. Bill, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, I would echo what everyone else said. And I, I think one of the things that struck me is what Gary said um, at the beginning of this, which was, I don't think snow days are gonna be a thing. Um, I think there are, there'll be an opportunity where, you know, especially if you're a faculty member who commutes from far away or something like that, where you're like, listen, the weather's not good. You know, even if the college doesn't cancel classes, we can all we can all meet and do a 25, 30 minute review session on Zoom, or here's this online activity we can do in place of what we are going to do. Um, I similarly have been digging through a lot of these uh, options and I've found a, a ton of surgeries that are available. A lot of uh, doctor's offices and, and hospitals are making their surgical videos available for review. And that's been a huge boon for my class where I can say, okay, it's a snow day. We were talking about the brain. You know, here's a surgery of a subdural hematoma. You know, take a look at that. We'll talk about this later. Um, so I think we, you know, we'll, we'll incorporate a lot of these new options. We will, um, and also as Gary mentioned earlier, on, like the, the boundaries between like when we are available and aren't available are going to kind of further erode so that if it's a, okay, you know what, you need to, you know, we're running out of advising time. I'll find two hours on Saturday. Just here's, here's the link, here's where we'll go. Um, and then you can, you can grab me there. Um, and so I think we'll start to see a lot of those things kind of come out. Um, I'm already prepping for the spring. Like if we have a snow day, like, okay, here's the activities that I'm going to pull because it's not really a snow day anymore. That actually uh, segues perfectly into one of our chat questions, um, specifically about boundaries. Uh, and the question is, have you all had a hard time trying to create or keep boundaries between the classroom and home life now that you can teach and learn from anywhere? And I say this, if many of you didn't hear my toddler jump into the conversation a few minutes ago and me tell him to appropriately leave. So 
Please. And I just say uh, we've had I've had a quite a few pre registration hours uh, these last couple of weeks and I've my toddlers heads will often pop right into the screen. Uh, so um, I, I it does make me a little concerned Gary's comment that uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be on uh, on call at all times. Uh, because uh, toddlers really wear you out. And so I sleep a lot more than my students do. <laughs> Anyone else about boundaries, uh, creating and maintaining them? I think definitely in the spring, um, it seemed like I was working 24 hour days, seven days a week, because I was always looking at emails for the students. Um, you know, they were requesting um, maybe to chat about a lecture and it seemed like I was working like seven days a week. So it's a little different now. So, um, but I see that, you know, that can easily happen again. When, um, when the pandemic first hit, I think in the first week and a half, I, uh, after the initial shock and sadness of having to leave campus, I thought, well, this is going to be you know, it's going to be at least less work. And um, as with Katie, I, I, I don't think I've ever worked so hard as I did um, in, in March, April, and May on, on every front to, to make this work. Um, but very fortunate to, to be an empty nester. And uh, I, I will just say, in, in speaking with students, they, they love to see your kids. They love to see your dogs. Um, this, this is actually enriches the experience for them, but am I grateful to be able to teach a class and then go have uh, lunch and coffee with my wife in the kitchen and come back to work? Yeah, pretty. If, if you don't have a toddler, it's, it's fine. <laughs> but though I, I will it. say one, one additional thing, uh, uh, in all seriousness, uh, my students at the beginning of the semester, uh, and this was a suggestion from IT, was to have them introduce themselves. And usually you do that in class and they sort of sit there and they say, this is me and I have a dog or something. And this time they could have pictures of their, you know, so they had to, my students had to build a little tower and they, of the things that were important to them that they, they were all freshmen, they just brought with them to school. And so they talked about, you know, these are my friends from home and these are, this is, you know, reminds me of my grandmother who's such and such. And so it was a little more personal. And, and so I think in some ways students got to see a little more of the, their students, uh, their fellow students uh, early on. Good. Bill? I, uh, I actually, to, to prevent some of that, um, I let my students know that that basically I, I would make myself available at certain off hours and I would set up a, um, it wasn't through Zoom, it was through yet another one of these through uh, Google Meet. Um, and basically I would have virtual office hours from like say seven to eight on, on a Thursday evening or something like that. And I, I did that to, I think preemptively get ahead of some of these issues where I, I didn't want to have a lot of people saying sort of demanding, you know, I can offer the Saturday morning thing if it's available, but I don't want people asking for it. And so I, I sort of preemptively did it by saying, hey, listen, I know everything's weird right now. And I know you're just used to swinging by my office. Um, here are some additional times that might be around the work schedule or around your other class schedules that, you know, I'll sit there and be working on something. It makes a little alert when someone joins the room um, and then we can sort of chat that way. And that was something I did. Um, I also, um, much like Jen mentioned, I introduced my cat right off the bat because he seemed to ignore me until I'm talking to the screen. Um, and so I did some of those things to sort of preemptively be like, hey, listen, you know, I, I'm not gonna be available all the time. Here are some extra hours where I will be available. Um, and it's often nice because you, you know, knowing our students, I don't have to worry about the 7 a.m. surprise meeting. It's the 8 or 9 p.m. surprise meeting. So if I said like, listen, I'll be available at 7, 8, but don't come find me before 10. Um, that was able to work a lot better as well to sort of set up these preemptive like, here's when I will be available. Um, and if you want to chat, I'm, I'm there. All right, thank you. Well, I think that's it for our questions. We did have a thank you though from an attendee who said on National First Responders Day, thank you for your hard work and dedication to St. Anselm and the students. Your dedication is appreciated and it doesn't go unnoticed. So thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Tana. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you everyone for joining today and we'll see you next time. <laughs>